Anyway, I'm Richard Sammons, and I'm an architect here in the village. And in fact, since I moved to New York in 1985 or 6, I've never lived anywhere else but the village. And I've actually never lived in anything but a townhouse. Um, in the 25 years we've been in business as Fairfax and Sammons Architects, we, we've averaged about one townhouse a year. Until now we've gotten to the point where the real estate agents have decided that there's very little product, quote unquote, left in the village. And, uh, well, mostly because we, they're all being combined and, 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 uh, and bought up. And oftentimes it's getting to be like Venice where nobody lives here anymore. And when that happens, the, the uh, you know, these people live here for, you know, one month a year, and so the, the shoe shine guy and the shoe repair guy and the, you know, the deli and all these little things that would normally be part of the village, you know, struggle. Um, I think all the cool people are still downstairs, but I'll talk to you all instead. Um, New York, we all know that New York is different than the rest of America. Uh, and we think it's because we're so different and so cool. But actually it's different than the rest of America because of, you know, conspiracy of things, combination of things, which include unique property rights, a unique pattern of development, um, efficiency, greed, speculation, and fire. And fire is actually a big, big deal. Um, we think of New York, I'm going to turn this on, because I've been told it has to be turned on first. If I can find where it's turned on, there we go. Um, we think of New York as defined by skyscrapers. And in fact, the popular imagination, when you talk to any you know, foreigner in New York, is all skyscrapers. But in reality, skyscrapers occupy a relatively small percentage of the land. And the rest of it is basically dominated by these little 25-foot lots, you know, with these little buildings on them, townhouses, and their commercial variants, basically, define uh, New York. Here's Washington Square. This is a nice little one here. Um, the, but when we think about the townhouse and its commercial variants, we also know that there's a different change in land ownership about every 25 feet. And this kind of um, richness of land ownership and the fact that on the commercial street you're walking by a different shop every 25 feet in a way, it's unique. This is a much richer environment. The grain is finer. Uh, and we, you know, we live in this sort of you know, petri just a very fine grain development and usership, and the, you know, just the pattern of land ownership, at least in the early part of Manhattan, was a very fine grain. Assemblages were quite rare. Now, the townhouse itself has very few, it has no classical antecedents. The townhouse, which we will define as the row house or the connected house of villages, towns, and cities, is really a product of free towns of the Middle Ages. A free town was a town that was essentially free from the king and its vassals. Here, people could own individual plots of land and individual ownership, whereas in the hinterlands, Everything was owned essentially by the king and then divided up through intimate domain to smaller and smaller holdings, which would give rights to smaller holdings in a, in, a, in a pattern of bundles of rights, of which the, the highest was the freehold and the more normal was the leasehold. Um, and below the leasehold, the, uh, the common hold, <coughs> was where you actually paid rent in kind to the uh, manor, uh, and essentially you were a serf. 
The other thing we need to remember is that the townhouse is essentially a northern type. It's a northern phenomenon. It's a northern European phenomenon. In the south, the classical um, pattern of courtyard houses remains, mostly due to the heat of the climate, but also the inertia of classical, of classical uh, culture. And these could be, you know, the Pompeian house to a hacienda to essentially an apartment building, still with the courtyard in the center and essentially a community of people living in the same property. This is, uh, this is, very few of these houses remain uh, from the Middle Ages, and this is the, one of two Romanesque houses I know of, one being in Genoa, so-called House of Columbus, and this one is in Lincoln, uh, and it's called the Jews' House, but you see here, um, it is, let's see, this is the guy here, you can see that it is, you know, connected to other buildings, the ridge pole is parallel to the street, and we have leftover bits of Romanesque work here, or Norman work, uh, a bit of a chimney that would have put in part of this, the hall, and this would have been a hall parlor house upstairs with commercial house below. Typically, in English, uh, the English pattern development, you know, followed suit, and the houses were connected. They typically had their their ridge poles to the street, and to gain, you know, upper stories, gables here, dormers here, in a way of, you know, essentially grabbing, you know, more square footage in each case. In the countryside, this was fairly orderly. In the city. It was fairly chaotic, and when you, if this is standing in for London, this is actually Ipswich, I believe. Uh, what you see in the city is chaos. Um, let's go back. The, the street here is being invaded by jetties, building out from the structure, and these were all wooden structures, and this kind of chaos was typically called the shambles. There's one in place in York called the shambles, and these kinds of development was called the shambles. This would all come to an end with the Great Fire of London in 1666. Um, the fire changed everything. Sir Christopher Wren, being a good architect, immediately uh, seizes the opportunity to design a grand plan for London on the on Baroque precedence, basically Rome of uh, uh, Julius, the Pope Julius. Uh, and it's a kind of a scheme with diagonals and monuments placed at uh, wrong points. This grand Baroque plan would not be uh, realized again until the layout of Washington, D.C., as it were. But the problem, the, the issue is that in 1667, the first infringements upon freehold properties, that is, properties held by individuals in cities, um, were enacted with the Building Act of 1667. Never before had, quote unquote, the common good or the state put limitations on individual, the development of individual pieces of property. And so, gone were the jetties. Gone were the, uh, the wood construction. And the rebuilding of London required more people than London had to offer. So, in walk the Dutch. The importation of Flemish workers brought masonry construction, particularly Dutch brickwork to London, and that town was rebuilt essentially in brick, sometimes merely a brick veneer, the sort of reassuring brick veneer on a wooden structure to kind of pretend that it's fireproof, but um, brick nonetheless. 
With the, um, the Flemish uh, workmen came the pattern of a Dutch development. In the city, which had been burned down and with the Great Fire, freehold property rights maintained the essentially footprints of these of, of the individual lots and the, and the pattern of the streets. So London was basically rebuilt upon its medieval plan. But outside of the city, as London con continued to grow, the virgin land, or the extramural land, as they're called, will be divided into regular sort of lots, long and skinny lots, uh, laid out in terraces and squares. You know, New Amsterdam is not alone. Venice, which is modeled on, also has the uh, similar pattern of long and narrow buildings to the street, or in this case, the canal. So we're going back here. And what is happening here in Holland is that you're trying to grab, you're trying to cram as many individual houses onto a, the utility the common uh, you know, thoroughfare, the canal in this case, as possible. Yes? Um, typically, how small would it be inside? I mean, if you can answer. These were actually quite large because they're very deep. Oh, uh, they might be very narrow, but they're very deep. They're also very dark. So the Dutch houses didn't have these enormous windows. And this is the pattern that would come to England in the terrace housing. The utility, which is the canal, uh, everybody had to pay for. So the more units you could get on the utility, the cheaper the property, as it were, the cheaper the development. And the canal was not only transportation, but it was also sanitation in a more prosaic situation. Uh, and so, when we think about the row house, it's almost a, in cities, it's almost a, you know, a, a, a foregone fact, a pre-determined pre, uh, fact that you're going to want to grab, you want to cram as many units on that utility as possible. Well, before the Great Fire of London and back here in New York, we were settled by, of course, the Dutch. And the Dutch, with them, brought their pattern of development. And over here, this is the stock house, of course. But over here, you see these individual crow's foot houses. And note that they are, the ridge poles are not parallel to the street, but they're perpendicular to the street. This is the Dutch pattern, which would, would persist. Yes? I have a really strange question. Do you see those Dutch gables on the top? These practicals? These guys? Yes. Do you think that influenced the Art Deco set mask at all? Unconsciously? No. No. <laughs> no. Do you think that's just a crazy idea? Can you repeat idea? the question, please? This, whether this little set back here uh, Could you repeat art, what he asked? the Art Deco, whether it influenced the Art Deco. Uh, no, because you're still building as tall to the street as possible. The setbacks of the Art Deco were based on um, the building zoning, the zoning which, would, which basically the pyramid wall. But do you, th do you think at some level it might have? Uh, yeah. No, not really. Okay. <laughs> this is a this is easy to do in brick, whereas a Diagonal in brick is difficult. You have to diaper the brick. So it's just an easier way to build the brick. Uh, the steep roofs are remnants of thatch houses, but thatch was uh, you know, outlawed in New Amsterdam very early on. And these all have pan tile roofs, just as they would in Holland. If we look at the New Amsterdam here, and there's Wall Street. There's Broad Street, there's the Canal at Broad Street, 
there's the fort, and the Scott House is over here somewhere. When you look at this, you think, it is not a medieval plan. You go down the day, you assume this is organic medieval plan. But in reality, it's sort of following the same pattern as Amsterdam, with these sort of concentric lines, and uh, here, you know, parallel to the, the, to the uh, shoreline, and then these lines coming up, just like the patterns of the canals in Amsterdam. So there's nothing chaotic about it. But what you do see, see here's Broad Street, and here are the typical Dutch houses with their gables to the street, tall and skinny things here, and individually placed. Um, none exist in New York, but if you go up to Schenectady, here's one, it's a little 17th century house, with its steep gables. In this case, there's the diapering that we just talked about, where these diagonal bricks will come in, diapers being triangles. And, you know, so you wouldn't have to have a step gable. Note also that we are seeing sash windows, another Dutch introduction. The sash doesn't leak like casements do. So the Dutch introduced the sash window? Mm -hmm. And only Holland and <coughs> Anglo Holdings, America, Australia, places like that, have sash windows. Continent has casement windows, in swing casement. England had outswinging casement windows because of the inclement uh, weather. And uh, the only other place you find sash windows is in Portugal because of the trade between England and Portugal. They also show up in the Veneto, oddly enough. Okay. And here's a blow up of that plan of New Amsterdam. And here, along the wharf, you see the individual houses each with their gables facing the street and basically shedding water on each other. Not that great an idea, but there it is. In contrast to this Dutch pattern, we have the English pattern. And, you know, as an example, we'll use Williamsburg, which was founded in 1670 when the capital had moved up from the malarial swamp of Jamestown to a little more wholesome area up uh, on the highlands. And here we see houses with their ridge poles again parallel to the street and majority of them. Anyway, we also see an all in the line. And this was not by chance. This was due to the implication, implication of um, the Building Act of 1667, which allowed people, allowed the state, to control the pattern development on freehold land, which had never happened before. Before we had chaos, after the fire, suddenly the state has the ability to regulate the form of buildings. And in, the, in the Williamsburg, the law was you could not shed water on another house. So the water could only be shed to the street or to your own personal garden, hence the parallel roof, the, the ridge pole being parallel to the street. It also said that all, all the houses had to align. <coughs> they couldn't be back and forth, they all had to align. And if there was a gap, it had to be filled in with a, a, a fence, see here, which, you know, just gave it a more a neater appearance and a more uniform appearance. And it's not unlike the typical pattern of an English village here, I think it was Shrewsbury, and we see the same thing happening. You know, sometimes trying to grab a little more with these giant dormers gates to the street. We look at the Frenchman's map, which is a map of Colonial Williamsburg. We see here all the little houses neatly aligned with their, you know, long to the street along here and here. The pattern continues, is, is the same in almost every English town. This Nantucket, parallel to the street, 
lining this Philadelphia, here in Boston. Again, you know, they can be quite big, but the pattern is similar. The pattern is the same. Only in Charleston does it differ much. And in this case, it's due to the climate being so hot and sweaty, and also the fact that most of these people came out of the Caribbean. So the veranda here became important. These were called piazzas in, in uh, believe it or not, in, in uh, Charleston. But the houses are not connected to allow for free airflow. And they are short to the street with a garden next to them. And again, this is called a single house. And it's all about sort of getting free airflow. Because it's bloody hot and humid there. Well, you'd only have free airflow if you're on a corner. Oh, uh, no, no. These, each one of these were, were separately spaced. And the verandas typically either, or the piazzas, either face south for shade or west for shade. But the houses be next to them wouldn't have an area of respect. Well, this is a gap. And that's, oh. this one's filled in. And these would be lined up as sort of individual fins along the street. And so that's the only <coughs> difference, the only uh, exception to this English pattern of, of development. Um, these are mostly 19th century houses, but they, you know, uh, the pattern uh, starts in the 18th century. Early, early on, they started, you know, the same way as every other English town, but they realized it was hot, sweaty, so you wanted to die. I heard when I was in Charleston and saw these houses that one reason for putting them that way was because of taxation. Not when they and had taxation to do with, along the street with windows except, and their position vis-a-vis -vis the, the the regular street. Yeah. So maybe taxation is also a except that it doesn't work because the frontages were essentially the same as if you put the house the other well, way. Well, you can't trust tall guys. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of large tales. Okay, back to New York, and of course the part that we're interested in is this part, you know, down here, which is the old Dutch section here. It begins to spread, and it's being spread more or less on grids and squares, you know, of terraces and squares. Here's Hudson Square, I guess, uh, common here, like London was. And, you know, so it's following the pattern of the expansion of London. You know, Bedford Square, Covent Garden, these things were uh, terraces and squares. And of course, we're up here somewhere. We like it up here. Um, and not much changed with the introduction of English pattern, the English uh, uh, law on top of the Dutch law. The towns, the houses were still more or less parallel. Uh, tight to the street, but the ridge poles changed, and now they're parallel to the street, but they're still deep. This one here with its gamble roof, still deep and skinny and long and deep, but the ridge pole now has changed. You know, along the Grand Streets, this being uh, Broadway, uh, we see these you know great uh, four and five bay houses. You know, more like one you would see in London, but for the most part, you know, New York was still with this sort of stuff. Skinny little houses, rich pole parallel to the street, but quite deep. Deep and dark and sweaty and everything else. You know, these survived. Here's the, the ear in in its former glory without the giant building next to it or anything else. It's my old car. Uh, you know, I still have one of these. Um, it's my daily driver. Uh, but you can see that these sort of modest houses deep to the street, and because you couldn't really span that in such in a in a one gable, the gambrel becomes kind of a, the standard roof point. Yes. That was owned by a free black man. Yes. Yeah. James Brown. It's what we call the James Brown house, which uh, you know. Not the guy who says I feel good. <laughs> but, um, now, here's a plug. 
It's because, you know, pie's in the backyard there. <laughs> you know, New York continues to grow, and the townhouse pattern, although perfectly adequate, could not keep up with the population growth. And so what happened is these townhouses were broken into, you know, myriad uh, different apartments. You know, so one townhouse, you could have eight apartments in, you could have eight families in, you could have this kind of thing. And the real death of, of New York was the tenement, in which you take a townhouse lot, although this is a loft building, take a townhouse lot and, you know, extend it up and cram as many, you know, flats as possible on it. What's All the distinction between the townhouse and the tenement? The tenement is a multifamily house. Oh, and and, what and it one designed as a multifamily house. And normally they would try to get it on the same townhouse lot. Sometimes you buy two, but th you know, buy three and put two uh, tenements on it. But they, they were, you had as many as, uh, they had two apartments on each floor. So one in the back, one in the front, stairs in the middle, but almost no uh, air circulation. You only had the one side um, to it. Sometimes a little air shaft, yeah. sometimes a dumbbell, uh, later on, but the original ones were just big townhouses divided into flats. The merchant's house, which is here, survives as a distinct example of a typical townhouse prior to the tenement phase. The house next to it, although built at the same time, has already grown a, a, you know, a four story and is most likely also uh, divided up into flats. Now, the anatomy. Where am I? Doing quite well without my notes. Um, The anatomy of the typical townhouse uh, was essentially narrow to the street, deep and long, and here's essentially the merchant's house, which we have 25 feet by a little more than 50 deep. The law was, early on at least, that you could only build on 50% of the lot, reserving the yard in back, it's not a yard, it's a yard, as a uh, a place for the privies, a place for a cistern, and a place for a well, often in very uncomfortable proximity to each other. <laughs> Up front, there could be an areaway which provided light to ground floors. But here we have the typical townhouse, and note that it is parallel, the, uh, it has a straight run stair. So it's not the greatest plan in the world, but so you always end up with these funny little rooms, top and bottom here, above, the, above this and above that. But these rooms are gracious, and the double parlor scheme, which you see here, um, is the typical, is typical of the townhouse. It allows for a little bit of cross ventilation between rooms, but also a little bit of shared light, and with judicious use of mirrors, pure mirror here, and the pier mirror there to bounce light back and forth, you know, it becomes almost habit. Here's the merchant's house. There's that pier mirror. Here's that we're in the dining, the rear parlor, which is the dining room. And there's the front parlor. And uh, the, these are both called parlors. But the front parlor with its windows, its mirror, and that's, that's mirrored on the south parlor. Now the front parlor usually ends up being the more formal of the two rooms. And it has a distinction, if you've ever been to the merchant's house at Halloween, you realize that the front parlor was also reserved not only for guests, but for the dead. And here would be where wakes would occur. In fact, the living room was an attempt to get people to actually go into this room by renaming it living room versus Death room. <laughs> <laughs> the death room. And the very formal room. And most of the life of the house when you're back here on the garden side. Now there's a variant to this which is more efficient. 
and we're going to talk about townhouses. It's, a, it's a potentially the greatest form of house we can do. The variant, which uh, although common in England in the 18th century, uh, pops up in the mid-19th century in New York, where the, the stairs are in the middle of the property instead of being down the side. And this allows for rooms with three windows on the back and here, so we get three windows wide, three windows wide, potential for it. And then we can sweep behind the stair here, and this could be skylit. So it's an improvement over the uh, straight run stair. And when you go upstairs, you can see that it actually works out. You get a little closet here, there's room for a bathroom, even though they didn't have bathrooms. This is a modern interpretation uh, of so really nice rooms really nice bathrooms, really nice closets, and this lovely circulation. An improvement on the typical New York townhouse. And if we look to England, we see every type of, you know, basically the first thing you do is decide where the stairs are. Oftentimes it's a front stair, and then a service stair in the middle. After a while, the front stair got dispensed with, and the service stair remains. Sometimes the stair is merely pushed to the back, again, to try to get good rooms along the street. Here's an example of that. We have a nice room on the street with a balcony. The stair is pushed to the back. And this bow front to the garden to, you know, enter somebody. Just like London, New York was also shaped by fires. The British let New York burn uh, during their occupation, and then it burned again in uh, 1832 and 1835, where large swaths of the city, basically all of the 18th century, all of Georgian uh, of New York, was either destroyed by fire or subsequent, um, subsequent development. Enter the commissioner's plan, and the revolution also provided, gave something as a benefit. There was all this land up here, New York being essentially a loyalist town, there was all this land up here which used to be owned by loyalists, which was now confiscated and essentially free. And so New York uh, followed the example of the Ohio Company of two decades earlier, where the confiscated lands of the Wyandotte and the Shawnee were basically chopped up into little squares and sold off to the highest bidder. New York couldn't be outdone, so they decided to take everything north of here and chop it up into little squares and sell it off to the highest bidder. Um, there are, with the exception of a few little squares, there's no place for public buildings. There's no special place, you know, um, given over for churches or or public buildings. And for the most part, it's a sole deadening plan. Um, and New York still, you know, suffers from it. You know, our major museum is on the side of the road. It's not, you know, it's not like, you know, the, you know, the opera house in, in Paris, which is at the end of the radiant streets. Now, it wasn't entirely stupid these terraces, we don't have many squares, but there's just these rows of terraces. And for the most part, the terraces, the lots run east-west, on the Albany east-west, basically. And that was an attempt to get at least maximum sunlight to the terrace houses. But the plan was divvied up into 20 or 25 foot wide lots, 100 foot deep. Um, If you look at the amount of property from here to there, and you realize that from about 1820 to 1900, this would all be developed. It's kind of amazing, just thinking about the amount of material was required, the amount of labor that was required to do this. It's unprecedented amount of construction. 
And in many ways, we think of the Erie Canal as you know, bringing, uh, as making New York prosperous and, and allowing it to grow. It could not have grown without the Erie Canal. When we think about the great song, you know, the Erie Canal, the barges are filled with lumber, coal, and hay, uh, because the horses needed hay, the town needed lumber, and you need coal to heat it. You add to that brick. I would like to have an actual number of the cubic feet, cubic yards of brick that was used between here and here. I can't. So, but it, it's a big amount. <laughs> it's big. Um, the um, but the demand for brick was so great that up the Hudson, you know, the brickyards proliferated. One of the big towns was Haverstraw. And Haverstraw produced so much brick that it started to mine uh, clay. It was mining clay underneath the town. In fact, the whole town slid into the sinkhole that was, that was um, the result of mining underneath the town. And so these Hudson stock bricks, which become the facades of these houses, you know, decimated entire uh, towns, uh, perhaps say New York. Also, New York had grown to the point where it couldn't feed itself with, with the immediate hinterlands. And so without the Erie Canal, and without in, improved transportation vis-a-vis uh, -vis the railroad, you know, New York could not have grown, it couldn't have fed itself. And uh, life was basically rude as sure short anyway. Excuse me, when, when did cast iron become more economical than brick? Uh, actually, never became more economical than brick. There's well, still brick parallel walls, cast iron facades. So, so cast iron, I thought at one point that it was, it was more. The point is in a townhouse, the wall, the parallel walls are structural. The facade is not. Okay. It's freestanding. So you could, you could, in order to get as many windows as possible, you could perforate that. And cast stone allows for you know, thinner structure and bigger windows. Um, now, so New York is basically built on greed and speculation. All these individual lots could be essentially you could buy a lot, you know, 25 and plot, you know, 62 up here, and it was it was uniform to it, you know lot. 42 and so and so. This was a uniform it's bundling of something you could basically trade as stock. <coughs> now it wasn't bought like by um, you know individuals. It was bought in lots. The speculators, um, greedy developers such as John and Jacob Astor, would buy large pieces and then sell them or rent them to individuals. Large leasehold properties here, uh, Queen Charlotte's Grant, and up here we have uh, Snug Harbor, uh, still exist. And leasehold property is part of the, uh, you know, part of the uh, uh, remnant of English uh, English practice. But for the most part, these would end up as individual ownership. Now, this kind of grid sold off to the highest bidder for speculation um, hasn't changed a bit. Here's a grid sold <laughs> off uh, to the highest bidder uh, for speculative purposes. Nobody really lives here. <laughs> it's just, you know, I bought this unit, it's the same as that unit, it's the same as that unit, just like the lots in the, in the, 19, or the 1811 commissioner's plan. So, in a way, this is what New York deserves. <laughs> now, the, the grid, of course, you know, you know, ran north and south, depending, you know, irregardless of, regardless of topography or cute little villas here, eminent domain took all and all was swept before for the greater good. Well, actually, for the good of the developer. Um, Back to our little, yes. And that was John Randall who sort of established the... The remain of the Randall plan. The, it's the commissioner's plan, yes. Um, back to the, our typical townhouse here. 
and you realize that the commissioners weren't all dumb. And in fact, that 25 by 100 foot or 20 by 100 foot lot was the most efficient you could easily get. And so when we look at the merchant's house here, uh, this little 25 by 100 foot lot, basically this would yield. Now you're also buying, when you build this, you're also buying the garden behind there and half of the street in front of it, the utility. Um, when you build in this pattern, you get about 15 houses per acre. If you go to 20 foot, you get 19 houses per acre. And if you throw 10 people in each of these houses, you can do the math and see that this is a pretty dense pattern of development. And the anatomy, of course, of the townhouses, these are parallel bearing walls. This wall here is also bearing, but it's bearing the uh, cantilevered section here of the stair. And the first thing people want to do when they buy a townhouse is get rid of this wall. It's a dumb idea. It's on the stairs. It's sort of sort of sliding into the hole that you created. Uh, so that little parallel wall there is important. And but all the sort of horizontal structure here, you realize that 25 feet is about as big a span as you can get, considering the trees don't really grow straight, uh, you know, to get uniform timber. It's the same thing in Venice, which was 18 feet, you know, 20 to 25 feet is the maximum you're going to do in normal timber framing. Uh, let's see, what else? Um, so that's the anatomy. This is essentially uh, not load-bearing, only holding itself up, so it can be punctured. And again, it's a very dark by the time you get to the middle here, but the mirrors kind of flip things around, and hopefully it's gone right here, if that makes things better. Uh, up the stoop and into this uh, vestibule allows for a little bit of, you know, not allowing the winter to come in the house, and then back here to the garden, the same deal. Well, to increase density, the first thing they did was to build higher. The, you know, the normal three-story house became a four-story house became a five-story house. And then somebody got the great idea to invade that area behind that house, uh, the garden, or the yard. And so the first, uh, one of the things that sort of appears uh, early to mid-century is this quote-unquote tea room. Sometimes you know, built as an addition, and sometimes built uh, you know, planned in general. But we can see that the yard is becoming invaded. And by the end of the, you know, before the new law was enacted, you know, 90% of the lot might be taken up and there's no yard whatsoever. So luckily we have sewage by then, we have broken water. So the, the requirement of the yard for sanitation was lessened, but it was still needed for light and air. And the room in the middle becomes very dark. Now, it's a dining room, so it's a nighttime room anyway. Um, but it's not great. What are the percentages now for lots in terms of? Uh, we are allowed up to 70% of lot coverage. Basically, the backyard has to be at least 30 by 40. Or, you know, 30 by 40 is 12 inches square feet. It has to be at least 25 inches. But most of the things in the village ignore that. You know, most things that we like in the village are actually illegal. All those little courtyards, you know, back chummies, those things are all illegal. Is, is there such a thing as a grandfather in the Yeah, they're all grandfather. Yes. I'm curious about this tea room. Um, the back of my building, which is 1854, someone said that around 1900, and I guess it's the tea room, a little extension that only went through three floors, the basement and two, and one I was using as a bedroom, but it's so cold in the winter. And it's not insulated. What were they doing? Sometimes they're framed. It was a tea room. Well, it was a frame addition, probably. Or maybe into the backyard, I call it the garden room. I don't know if I had guests in the or summer. Or there are, uh, um, sometimes, there's, on both sides. sometimes there's a stack of privies. Oh, I see. Sometimes. But the tea room is really just a, a developer's ploy to get yet another room and invading the Was envelope. it usually not? Um, they were heated. Heated or insulated? Well, the the frame construction wasn't all that long. Uh -huh. And 
that your side walls are both heated by your next door neighbors. Yeah. Uh, da, da, da. Now why am I here? Enter back the greed of New York. Let's see. Oh, what would happen if New York wasn't based on this uh, uh, long skinny lot? But we play with the geometry of the lot, and maybe we can prove upon the townhouse form as it is in New York. So in playing around here, uh, I thought, let's do a house that is, let's do a lot that is 30 by 60. We'll keep the rule where you're only building on half of the lot. And you know, this would be a, a plan you would come up with. But it's a double pile house with two parlors, kind of a center all here, you get a WC there, a kitchen to the back, and a pretty nice little house with light and air on both sides. You know, a much lighter and airier house. Um, and when we look at that, we see that it yields 18 houses per acre, a little more than the 15 houses per acre of the 25 foot by 100 foot lot but less than the um, 20 by 100 foot lot. Now there's something called the utilization rate, which is after you add in the amount of square footage you can build, in this case we're, we're going to get four stories, to the amount of road you have to build, you know, that area in front of it, which you have to pay for as well, um, it ends up with a utilization rate of only 1.4, whereas the typical townhouse pattern has a utilization rate of 1.58 for the 20 foot and the 1.59 for the, um, the 25 foot. So the 25 foot is pretty efficient. And this attempt to you know, introduce kind of an English pattern of a double pile house, you know, even though we shorten the lot, we widen the lot, is yielding less than the New York commissioners. <coughs> Okay, well, let's uh, see what happens if we go to 40 foot. 40 foot single pile house, 40 foot deep here, and we're able to get five bays now. The previous house was a four bay house, which has the advantage of being able to divide it into two equal, you can have two bedrooms here, into two equal rooms in back. The three bay house, you always end up going a little skinny room, which is unusable, and almost a nice room. And those little funny rooms, Upstairs become closets, bathrooms. Nobody knows what to do with them. And when you look at this house, uh, you can still get 18.5 per acre, a little more than the previous house, but its utilization rate, again, that's the amount of square footage you can build per the amount of raw land that was consumed, is down to 1.2. So the commissioners are still winning. And uh, despite the fact that the houses are dark and gloomy, and uh, you know this might be a nicer house to live in. It wasn't as efficient a plan of utilizing the square footage of the raw land. But the good thing about this is actually you get two parking spots up front, which might be a good. You know, if we wanted to build a new town, this might be a better pattern than New York because I, you know, I can't never park my car anywhere. Um, You know, fun with geometry, uh, this is a, a notion of, of doing a bunch of townhouses, you know, grouped in kind of this kind of gerrymander of way in London. This is by a guy called um, Ernest Newton, and these are all three floor houses, and he got 40 houses to the acre in this plan. Again, the efficiency of the square versus the rectangle, and so on and so forth. At 40 to the acre, and here's what that would look like. So, where there were down at 19 an acre, it is possible to do the same thing and get uh, sort of 40 per acre. Now, the cheat is that these are apartment buildings from the corner. Now, there's also a lot of leftover lots between the village where you had to cram things in where things could be. Um, these two houses, which I live in, are the back houses to these houses on the more fashionable Washington place. So these, you know, quote unquote carriage houses are still 25 foot wide, but this one's only about 12 feet deep. And 
its second smallest house in the village at... Uh, what street is that? West 4th Street. Uh -huh. These were owned by Arm and Hammer. And for years, they were sort of, you know, sort of, you know, closed off. We had to fence in the bushes. You know, people just walked by and think they were the, you know, the, the switching, you know, like the telephone company built a sham house to you know, hide their switching gear. And so <laughs> most people thought that that's what it was. Um, when I, when we bought it, we added the shutters, we added the little thing on the roof, which, you know, followed these things and the bushes out front and stuff like that, tried to make it a nice house, thinking that if we made the street nice, people would behave better. There's like 12 bars in the street, people have not behaved any better. And um, the garden is basically a, a surrogate trash heap. Also, you know, we've had places where there were gaps between buildings, and these could easily be filled in. Uh, with townhouses as well. This is also on West 4th Street, and this is the smallest house in the village. It's 12 feet wide and about 15 feet deep. At two stories, it's uh, anyway, it's small. It's like less than three inches square feet. Uh, the Edward Ed St. Vincent's Malay House is only nine and a half feet wide. It's a similar situation where it's just filling in between two buildings, plus a carriageway. Uh, but it's very deep, so it's actually a very large house. This is the smallest house in the village. It's across from the corner of Bistro, if you want to find it. It's across from the corner of what? the bar. Now, other cities produce other sort of substandard housing, and what America needs now, what the Europe needs now, is really substandard housing, because the standards are what make everything expensive. Um, this little house, it's called a Trinity House, or Father, Son, Holy Ghost House. And they are all over Philadelphia. And essentially, we have about 15 feet here, about 25 here. One room, stair, one room, stair, basically three rooms above each other. They yield 50 units per acre. And the utilization rate is still about 1.56, which is about the same as the New York townhouse plan, but let's face it, they're kind of substandard stuff. Um, here they are. The only thing good about them is usually on slightly smaller streets, so the utilization rate may be slightly bigger, but they're only two bays wide, and you, know, you basically get one, one sort of function per floor, and New York is not uh, as these as well, but usually as back houses, where you're filling in um, the leftover depth behind irregularly shaped uh, block, uh, blocks, which the village has a couple of these. I mean, this is the most famous, which is Grove Court. And although these are three bay houses, they're essentially the same as the father, son, and the ghost house. Other experiments, also in the village, are the, these are the two sisters, which share a garden in between them, and if you extrapolate this as a building pattern, it would essentially be a checkerboard of house, garden, house, garden, house, garden, uh, utilization rate of um, a little less than 1.5, and uh, but otherwise, you know, something that tried but never, never continued. Where is that? That's down on the. That's down on the. The Commerce Street, yeah. the Cherry Lane Theater, so it's over there. But it's also one of these weird little places where the two grids. Now you know that Greenwich Village is a grid, and we're actually the right grid, and the rest of the city is on the wrong grid. These things have just when they crash, it just stay on it. But we're, we're right and they're wrong. Ours are, ours are much more logical. Now, I throw this slide in here because yesterday was Ernest Flagg's birthday. Ernest Flagg was a great architect, and uh, this was his house. It's like the it's like, you know, 60 something street. And Ernest Flagg was also uh, a great reformer when it came to domestic architecture, and his model tenement uh, became the basis of the new law flat, the new law. 
which would develop, which would uh, kind of curtail some of the uh, more excessive uh, vices of the tenement, which provided a, um, the tenements were about 90% of, of the lot coverage, and this would bring them down to 70%, which provide a large light well in between, and the dumbbell flat, essentially the same thing, but at least there was light and air going down the middle. And so, when he built his own house, uh, he did the same thing. Here's the light well going down the middle. This was his office. He loved uh, Dutch architecture, so it's, uh, he's got a little gable there. And you see it's incredibly inventive. The, the stoop is on the side, and the inner here, which allows for you know, the front facade to be uninterrupted by hallways and whatnot. You have full rooms on the front facade, unlike this where you have a hallway on one side. Uh, anyway, so there's many, many inventive ways you can deal with pattern. Give me my hand at it. There's a leftover site on Bank Street where I lived down the street. And of course, it was known by Gottlieb, so it would never be sold. It's an old gas station site. Uh, but early in my tenure here in New York, I envisioned a little townhouse there. I thought I could live down here in the flat. And rich people could live up here and work the car there. Um, and you amaze that given such a rich history and such you know, an easy model to follow that people still get it wrong. <laughs> we don't know why they get it wrong. They get it wrong. Um, these are three houses on, again, on West 4th Street. I walk to work between, between West 4th and Ganson Work, so I'm on this little rat you know, trail between the two. So on West 4th Street, I walk by these houses when they're being built, and the developer thought, okay, Let's try a modern one, and then let's be safe and do kind of two traditional ones here, which is really one big guy, you know, still. And these have obviously sold and appreciated. This one, not so much. <laughs> you gotta wonder why they didn't do a third one of this, but for variety's sake, uh, you know, what are these, what is that? And, and uh, numerous mistakes would be seen here. <laughs> anyway, it's not a pleasant street, nor does it add up to anything. Where these are adding to that, these don't add up to anything. Sorry, what's the flag top factor? 66 oh, Street, I think. Oh. And uh, 66 and uh, um, Park Avenue. John Russell Pope lived around the corner. So lots of, John Russell Pope actually had a townhouse around the oh, corner. Yeah. So it's, you know, good architecture of that. Uh, now, they still get it wrong. I think you all know what this one is. This is quote unquote uh, Greenwich Court, which are the townhouses attached to the um, uh, 11th Street, the, uh, to St. Vincent's Hospital. Ooh, ooh yes, the immense Rudin family. But these houses here, uh, was an attempt to bring the scale down so it would match the scale of the neighborhood. So they decided to build five townhouses, and they couldn't be deadlier. <laughs> uh, you know, what is wrong here? Now, first of all, you might assume this is just a total lack of ornament or lack of character, but what's the lack of character about? Notice that that window and that window are exactly the same as, as that window. And uh, so, in a normal townhouse, the windows get smaller as you go up, as the floors get shorter as you go up. So that, you know, as you get tired, you can you know, you can, can anticipate a shorter flight of stairs. <laughs> uh, and not only the normal townhouses are sort of built in groups of three for stability factor. This is actually built as one giant building, which is really part of the big building up here. Now the irony is here that the developer's daughter bought one of these, and Fairfax and Sam is in the process of making it happenable <laughs> to the tune of $3 million. Um, in contrast, Fairfax and Sam has also did this group of seven townhouses in Brooklyn on State Street. These, uh, the developer insisted on the most narrow lot possible. These are 15 feet wide, which is almost, you know, but 
in order to try to get light into them, we introduced these bay, bow fronts um, and then alternated townhouse with the bow front townhouse, the flat front. The flat fronts get stooped, the bow fronts enter on the ground floor, and they all have, uh, the stoop ones have uh, rentals down below, but they're single family houses. Um, the developer, I pleaded with the developer to reduce it to six, you know, so we can get 18 feet each. And then I did sort of funny geometries or L-shaped houses. Dead ears, the developer had, it wouldn't pencil. The developer had one idea, and that was to cram as many little houses on the street as possible. So, undeterred, we came up with this. The, in contrast to the very expensive 11 string houses, these were built at $300 a square foot, under $300 a square foot, which is unheard of in New York real estate. Where does the brownstone model come from? Brownstone is just the continuation of the townhouse. It is the continuation. And it's just because it's brownstone and not brick. So it is the same as so brownstone. This is brownstone, yes. What year were these from? Just finished. Oh, which did she and what would be good again? A Hoyt and Skimmer one. Oh, so funny. It's uh, Brooklyn Heights. Yeah. And, okay, well, here we go. Now, the, the real estate, the, the developer thought that he was going to sell these for, you know, ghastly amounts of money. Yes. 2.5 million, yeah. maybe three. The first one sold for 6.1. And so, even as he cheeked out on the railings and forced me to put seven on there instead of six, uh, yeah. he still made a tremendous profit. Back to, uh, and here's, you know, it's not unprecedented. We think of both fronts as a Boston thing, but they're kind of in Chelsea as well. So that's the both front. But in contrast to these buildings, which were built at $900 a square foot, having it and then renovated at another thousand dollars a square foot because they're not inhabitable, uh, ghastly, uh, these are oh. a 300 dollars a square foot. So it can't be done. In fact, the townhouse is the most economical form of housing. And we wonder why the rest of America doesn't do it. You know, why are we stuck with the single family house or the detached family house? In um, contrast to, the, here's a little bit of figures here. A townhouse versus a freestanding house has only 66% of the material of a freestanding house owing to that party wall. Uh, it has 60% of the envelope because you're really only heating uh, two walls. And it is 50% easier to heat and cool. So it's the most economical form you can come to. Um, also, it has fewer windows because you only have the front and back. And you only have to worry about architecture essentially on the front of the house, as opposed to all the way around. And so it's a really cheap house to build. Uh, these houses we built in a town called Poundbury, which is Prince of Charles's novel town in Dorset. And these are uh, semi detached two townhouse buildings, some of the trees, and these were built around. 2006. That's a new development? Brand new. In a brand new town. They actually have good railings. Um, and the developers, these became so uh, profitable and popular, the developer actually kept our plans and made about 20 more. Um, and so we have more of these than we actually designed. Thank you very much. Um, our practice has been basically dealing with Restoration. Here's the stoop restoration and getting the windows back, things of that nature. This is Charles Street, as it was there, Jessica Parker's house. Um, and, you know, interior, such as this kitchen, this is the tireless kitchen. And, you know, a little flower room, same deal. But when we talk about, you know, I always send clients over to the merchant's house and they look at this house and they go, oh, I can never live in that. Mm -hmm. And I say, well, what could you live in? How could we make this townhouse form applicable uh, to a growing family, as it were? So we have these clients. They own this little house on 11th Street, across from Liv Tyler's house. And it had recently been quote unquote renovated. Unfortunately, it has a sort of bad brownstone stuff going on. 
and I think it changes between, well, in other words, and it's a little Italian eight house since it's only 18 feet deep wide. So it's a challenging house. More challenging is the backyard's only 10 feet deep, and there's a tenement right up against it. So this sort of substandard house uh, we had to make habitable for a family with four children, all preteen. Mm -hmm. They were living in Hong Kong, and they said, take your time, blah, 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 and, you know, just do the house up right. And they called back about a month later and said, oh, my job has been reassigned. I'm coming to New York. I've got four kids. What can we do? Um, so this little house, um, here's their part of their Hong Kong stuff. We did, we did I'll just present this as an example, not just of our work, but also how we make a house very livable for a modern family. So as usual, you walk into the front door, and there's the straight one stair. You see the parlors over here. We snuck a bathroom back there. We managed to salvage the newel post, even though we built the stairs entirely. And like a good preservationist, I ignored all the rules and earlyed up on the inside because I don't like Italian. I like the revival better. Um, <laughs> so here's the front door, the stairs going up. And all of this you see is brand new. This was two apartments. And it looked like a sheetrock box from the 70s where we all, all of us artists live, you know, continue to live in. Um, we also did the decorating, but we introduced all this. This is right off the shelf of composition ornament from Decorator Supply. And here's the revival entry into the living room. There's the detail of it. Looking into the living room, there's that detail again. Uh, the fireplace and the proper Greek and Latin cornice. And looking into the back parlor, which comes with a library, the man of the house, and sort of a more informal room where the TV set is. And off of that, in that funny little area, you know, behind the stair, the what to do with, we stuck this bar. And so, you know, we're getting a lot into this ground floor already. When you go upstairs, and just put them up there, we have bedroom, bedroom. This is the master bedroom. Is this one on the tourist It was. Yeah. So here's a little, there's the fireplace in the master bedroom. Uh, you know, purpose-built stuff. Uh, the front room was an office and it got some nice detail in as well. You put that detail in. Absolutely, everything in here is brand new. Uh -huh. There's nothing in yeah. Is that plaster? That's this composition. Composition. Yeah. This is plaster. That's plaster. It could be plaster, but composite is cheap. Um, four boys. So above that, above that floor, on the third floor, we had to get four bedrooms. So it's a bedroom in the back, a bedroom in the front. And then for the younger kids, there are two of these little bunk rooms, each in that funny little area above the stair. Uh, so this is the blue one, and there's the yellow one in the back. Uh, so these are the little kids' rooms. Now, the heart of the thing, of course, is downstairs. And this opens up into the mud room. There's the stair going up. This is the, uh, the ground floor foyer. And that opens up into a little uh, family dining. And then back to the kitchen, just like any other townhouse. Looking through the kitchen, you see these um, cabinets, which have glass on both sides. They're built you know, in an attempt to get more light in. Here we go again. There's the kitchen. There's the opening to the family dining. There's the kitchen. And then lots of glass to the 10-foot deep garden. And glass on both sides of the hang here so we get light throw. When you go to the 10 foot garden, uh, you have to make the most of what you have. This is a huge tenement here. We snuck back and painted it white. <laughs> <laughs> we added this trellis and this mirror behind the trellis reflects light. In. And then of course down in the cellar, you have the wine cellar. And the old 
And that is the story of the Greenwich Village townhouse. <laughs> <laughs>